um, I was going to start with a few stories um, about our uh, president, uh, president uh, since um, he was a lecturer in Manchester when I was training up there, but uh, I've been told it'll, um, none of them are clean enough, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so, the first thing is, do I know what I'm talking about? Um, other people seem to think I do, they keep putting me on uh, committees, so um, I've gone with the flow a little bit, and uh, uh, I hope uh, I can pass some of that information on to you. But, um, rather than stick to a normal lecture format, I thought I'd start with a quiz and make sure you're all awake after the gala dinner. So this is a question from, uh, uh, so basically this talk, um, I've gone to optometrists I work with and don't work with and they've given me some of their burning questions. Um, this one's from um, uh, an optometrist down in London who uh, runs a very large multiple um, and he wants to know why refractive surgery only lasts two years. I think this is the answer. So, is it because it's a great business model? We can just repeat it every two years? To ensure that we're not going to send these patients ever back to you ever again? Because it's not a good procedure? All of the above? Or none of the above. I'm sure it's all um, it's D, isn't it? It's all of the above. Why don't refractive surgeons have laser surgery? <laughs> because it only lasts two years. <laughs> they can't find somebody any any good at it. Again, because it's not a good procedure. Or all of the above. Or none of the above. Are they, has to be all of the above again. Why does the costs vary so much? I mean, you, um, we've all seen the adverts, um, 399 per eye. Some refractive surgeons are much greedier than others, obviously. Uh, some uh, chains wanted to um, take a market share of laser and glasses. Some clinics use technicians. Uh, what you see is not always achievable. So uh, the, the the companies um, advertising 399, most of them, um, the average price is 1200 to 1400, not 399. And of course, not all um, surgeons are doing high volume. So um, that does have a major impact on uh, uh, on the costing. Not to mention uh, the training levels. <laughs> so, um, so one of the surgeons in Cindy's neck of the woods, um, uh, not in the hospital, um, but in the high street, um, did six months ophthalmology training in total before he became a refractive surgeon. So he's done many thousands now, but um, yeah, at, uh, at, at the bottom line, he's not had his full training. So, okay, patients, I mean, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> so, just as background, um, you know, how many procedures are performed? 18 million in America so far. I mean, it's difficult to get an exact number, but the, the, this is what um, is being quoted. 7% of their population. So we're not anywhere near that number, but um, you have to um, you have to think that if seven percent of your population are going to have this, then you need to be aware of this, and potentially you need to be involved. So uh, I'll to rush through this because I think uh, um, a lot of this was covered in the um, uh, in the last lecture. But um, basically. Uh, contact lenses um, are problem free. Um, most of my patients who come for this are contact lens failures. We, we don't tend to go out looking for um, people, um, neophytes. Uh, you know, th these are normally people who've gone through the contact lens route and appeared at the other end. So um, maybe the new materials and things will make a difference and um, you'll retain them for longer. But uh, it, it, the, um, my patients will be turning around to me saying, um, I have a pro problem for one reason or the other. 
And why do some of the optometrists not want to get involved? I'm sure the lack of knowledge is um, a large portion. Uh, I mean, in the training nowadays, uh, I think in Aston, Shazad Naru does a one hour lecture on refractive surgery, which um, isn't going to give you um, a great deal of uh, information to take on. It's just a touch. Um, obviously, see um, something you're not familiar with, you may not be confident in. And you may not have the personal contact with the surgeon um, to make you comfortable. So, you know, patients and optometrist carers need to have um, confidence in what they're doing. And uh, those of you with um, sharp eyes will see. Um... <laughs> so, you know, the, um, a lot of my patients have gone to a high street clinic and just the way it's set up and the fact they don't see somebody who they uh, um, can put faith in, um, they leave. So, um, I mean, this is somebody trusting their eyes to you, so they have to feel comfortable. And alternatively, you know, there are optometrists who um, see this as an opportunity. Why? I mean, firstly, retain patients. Um, I mean, the, uh, the big, it's less so now, but um, it used to be that patients did not want to go back to their own optometrist because their own optometrist um, was trying to dissuade them from having laser surgery. And so, um, so um, the bond has been broken and uh, that patient will go somewhere else for their future follow-ups. Um, you can actually strengthen your links. Um, if you're doing co-management, um, the patient actually um, comes to you and gets you know, know you a lot better. Um, and you can attract new patients in. So either patients, if uh, the word gets around that you're, um, you're involved in refractive surgery um, and to so attract new patients, but also it will bring in their relatives if they feel uh, you're, you're providing a good service overall. And of course, um, it's, it's different. So some people like doing it just because it's different. And you will learn more out of it. Um, so, uh, the, so for people who are worried about their glasses sales, um, I mean, these patients are probably gonna go and have refractive surgery anyway. So if you're pragmatic, they're going, you're going to lose that portion. But, it, but if you can retain them, and um, they'll be your patients in the future for, uh, for either the small correction that they still have or um, for readers, etc. So just, just talking about lasers now. Um, there are some limits to the technology. So you might um, feel that uh, the high street clinics uh, um, are selling you that lasers, uh, lasers can treat anything, but technology has its limits. Now, uh, the bit I like here is the, um, is the bicycle pannier on the side with the, uh, uh, the bucket as the uh, baby holder. So there, there are ranges for um, laser procedures. Um, but there are no real rules because um, it depends on the laser and it depends on the surgeon and primarily it depends on what the patient is expecting. So there are some patients, um, in fact I had two last week, both with um, prescription of minus f a nine with a minus five sil, same day, um, two patients. Um, that's not treatable and they were both um, 21. 21, 23. Um, so you're probably not going to go intraocular on them. So if you discuss it, this with a the patient, they might be happy to be left at minus two, minus three, um, because that's still dramatically different from uh, uh, from what, uh, where they started. So um, you do have to spend time talking to the patients. But in general terms, um, the limits for laser have come down because this is what we know we can do relatively safely. So um, from about plus four to minus nine, um, the cylinder, um, you can theoretically treat anything. The practicality of it is, um, uh, which is difficult, is um, aligning uh, your uh, axes so that you're actually treating exactly on one axis. Because you, you're measuring them sitting up and then you're lasering them lying down. Um, so you have to have quite a lot of um, software to um, allow for the torsion of the eye as they lie down and 
Um, when you start looking at these things, um, quite a few eyes um, talk 30 degrees when you lie down. So you might as well forget this, um, the starting uh, this procedure. So LASIK um, or PRK, um, I mean this, this is a surface procedure, so it's better for a thin cornea. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through too much in detail, but with LASIK you're cutting the cornea. So you're going to cut um, a third of the cornea, lift it up as a flap, laser it and then put the flap down. So you weakened it by the third just from the cut and then you're going to remove some more. Um, with LASIK all you do is you uh, remove the epithelium with alcohol, laser some off there and uh, then put the epithelium back on. So if you've got a thin cornea to start with, um, you, can, you can get away with doing LASIK. But, um, there are some arguments for uh, doing LASIK for every um, prescription rather than LASIK. Um, high street clinics like LASIK because vision is instantaneous and the wow factor for the patient is high and then they feel it's more likely that those patients will uh, um, tell their friends all about it. But um, there's some patients uh, uh, you, know, you may not want this, uh, to do this to. Um, um, does it work? Uh, now this, I'm, I'm not pre I'm presenting my good results, I'm presenting my published results. Um, so um, this is a group, um, we're split into a spherical uh, group, so less than a diopter cylinder, and an astigmatic group, more than a um, diopter. Um, what I'd get you to look at is the range, there's no laser pointer assistant. Um, the, the range treated here was um, minus 9.5 out to plus 5.5, so um, uh, this is including everything. This is not just the middle range where you're going to get good results. Um, in the astigmatic group, the, um, the average cylinder was two diopters, um, but going out to five and a half. And if you look at the first couple of bars, so the purple is um, spherical and um, uh, the blue is uh, astigmatic. So you're getting 75, 78% within a quarter of a diopter of what you aim for. So, uh, you know, um, it's not a bad result. I mean, you, okay, you, you, you've got, um, uh, you're getting to 98% within a diopter, but generally those are the complex ones which are out. So, you know, either they're, um, they're the minus nine with a, with, uh, with the degree of cylinder or um, their mixed astigmatism and uh, mixed astigmatism is slightly more difficult to do because you, um, you just don't know where it's going to, um, what the hyperopic shift is going to be from uh, treating the cylinder. So is it safe? So um, a portion, this is at three months, a portion lose a line of vision. Uh, you might say quite a big portion. Um, five, five percent, but we are normally talking six four to six five, or six five to six six. It's not. Um, uh, it's not uh, sort of at, at the because obviously these people are good vision to start with. But the interesting bit is um, how many patients are gaining vision, particularly um, with uh, um, <coughs> the high astigmats and. It's interesting that uh, eyes which um, have been documented as amblyopic can get um, a gain in a reasonable amount of gain in vision. So, which, which procedure do you, um, would you choose to do if you're doing laser? It depends. There's no one procedure which fits all. So, depends on the occupation, what they need whether they've got dry eyes um, as pre-existing, even if it's borderline, you know, if, if they're getting uh, contact lens intolerance problems but no clinical dry eye without the contact lenses. Depends on the corneal thickness. So lots of depends. So you, you have to see the patient and um, uh, discuss it. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't follow the, um, uh, you know, where practically everybody gets LASIK. They're just some patients you wouldn't want to. Um, one of my Irish colleagues had just treated two of the Irish team with LASIK um, just before this picture came out and 
well, you can see that uh, that if that had a LASIK flap on it, um, it would either be torn off. Um, it, I mean, it's not going to have a good result, whatever happens. So is the procedure painful? LASIK, it shouldn't be. Um, I'm talking after the procedure. No, the procedure itself shouldn't be painful at all. Um, remember that um, with the same proximethacaine, uh, amethacaine, you do cataract surgery with, so you should be able to do LASIK without uh, any trouble at all. So unless the epithelium is disrupted, there shouldn't be any pain. Um, LASIK, you've, um, you've lifted the epithelium, so there is a potential for a lot of pain. Um, remember, there are more nerve endings in the cornea than anywhere else in the body. So um, when I first did some, um, well, in fact, when we did some studies with Aaron Brahma in Manchester on this, uh, um, people would put um, laser surgery, or not people, women would put laser surgery as more painful than childbirth. Um, but that's if you don't manage it properly. So there are adequate um, ways of um, uh, sorting out the pain relief, which you must give before the pain comes, um, so that the pain doesn't come at all. So, I mean, a couple of examples. I mean, I laser out in Jersey. Um, almost every time I'm over, we see people out in the, um, in the evening after having that, had their laser. They just, uh, partly it's island culture and they just get on with things, but it's, uh, they don't seem to have a problem. Um, t two of my staff um, who've had this done, one had hers at nine o'clock because um, she wanted me to be fresh. Um, she, was still at, um, she was still at work at four, um, having had her laser, and the other one um, uh, insisted on coming to the Christmas party in the evening uh, after she'd had her LASIK. So the, the procedure, which in theory is very painful, doesn't have to be at all. Anesthetic. Are you awake or asleep? Unfortunately, you're awake. The, um, you, need, um, you need the patient to fixate. Uh, and centrate on the uh, on the center of the laser because you're normally treating on the visual axis, so you don't really want to guess that for them. Um, you can have um, some Valium, and um, if you're running a full theatre, then uh, I mean we have an anaesthetist uh, available, so we we will give intravenous sedation if we have to. But generally. Um, Generally, you prefer not to because it's a it's a dicey thing. Because um, if you give them too much, um, then uh, then they close their eyes. So one eye at a time. No, we generally do both. Um, that's normal around the world. So, um, what's the ri additional risk of doing one versus two? If there is a laser problem, then you're, you're obviously going to have that laser problem on both eyes. Um, and there's a risk of, um, well, you have a risk of infection, um, but you will uh, put both eyes um, uh, at risk of the same infection if, if it's coming from something in, in your theatre or uh, uh, rather than the environment. Um, in reality, the, it's not a laser problem which is um, because uh, the laser goes through numerous checks before you use it. So if there's going to be a problem, it's um, normally human error. Um, there, was, uh, there was one clinic in uh, Dublin which uh, had two patients of the same name on the same day, and they treated the, uh, the myope as a hyperope. Um, uh, so, uh, so that certainly can happen. Um, infection very rare in this. Um, I mean, it's exceedingly rare. So, the, um, and bilateral infection, unheard of. Uh, so, yes, it's a risk, but um, not a huge risk. And it, it comes back to your relationship with the patient if they know there's an open door. So, if the eye's getting, um, if, if they're not feeling right, the eye's getting redder, the vision's going down, um, or the uh, eyes becoming more, more painful and they come in for a check and you, uh, you have to accept in these situations that 99% uh, of the time you're, you're going to say it's fine but at least everyone's happy that there's no problem. So, but ultimately it's the patient's choice 
So um, some patients will choose to have one eye uh, done at a time, and they always regret it. <laughs> always regret it. Um, just going through it twice. And they always find the second eye worse than the first, just because they know it's coming. So how long does the laser take? Any ideas? Yeah. Well, it uh, depends on the laser. Um, the range is about 10 to 60 seconds, depending on, um, largely depending on, on the prescription you're um, uh, treating. So, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, you can do a lot of patients, but um, because you, you've got to stick to um, check, double check, triple check everything, make sure, you're, uh, um, make sure the preparation's okay. Um, that, it's that which takes the time, getting the patient in, getting them prepped, um, rather than the laser itself. Um, there's, there's push to uh, make these lasers even faster, um, but I don't know, at, uh, at some point um, you wonder whether, uh, you, know, you know, if they get the 10 seconds down to three or four, is somebody going to object to paying £3,000 for three seconds of treatment? <laughs> Will you see straight away? Uh, answers yes. So you're not going to be covered up. You're, um, you will be able to see through uh, whether it's LASIK or LASIK. Whether it's a, um, uh, you know you will be able to see enough to get around um, without any problem. What you won't be doing is driving, um, and you won't drive until you're legal to. Uh, I mean, we we tend to. Uh, requests that the patients don't drive um, until they come back and see us so that we can uh, verify it for them but uh, you know that I, I mean ultimately they can check themselves um, if they have to what about working <coughs> um, yeah generally no problem so it depends on um, the population you attract uh, you know, um, my population uh, tends to be um, sort of middle class of office based, so the, um, there's absolutely no problem. Um, but I try and get them to uh, see if they can do four or five days from home, if, uh, if their job would uh, allow. So for me, I tend to treat on Fridays, so they got the weekend to recover anyway, um, and then uh, uh, see them in the, uh, midweek, and um, hopefully they've taken it fairly lightly over the. Uh, uh, over the first few days. The reason not being that they won't be able to, um, the reason being um, that once in a while somebody will have a problem and if they've made um, commitments that they then can't keep, that's actually more problematic. So uh, you just uh, tell them that you're erring on caution. So once you've done this treatment, will it change or get worse? It, it really shouldn't do. Um, so. In some patients, you get some early regression. Um, so, you know, you do a treatment, you have a good result initially, and then um, then the healing process takes it um, uh, back a bit. T uh, typically, in high myopes um, and higher hyperopes. But um, especially if you're doing surface treatment, you can modify that with a uh, mitomycin, which is a anti-cancer drug. So, um, whereas for cancer, you you would have it. Uh, sort of injected into you, with this you just um, paint it on the cornea and um, it's, uh, it stops the aggressive healing and works very well. Will I need any glasses afterwards? Now, um, it's wrong to promise somebody perfect vision. I mean, even if they come in at, at minus one, you know, they, uh, if, you're gonna, if you promise them perfect vision, the, um, they may end up with something a bit odd. Uh, so um, I'm always uh, very cautious of, uh, of what I offer them. Um, and if I have a patient who insists on absolutely perfect vision, it's better I don't treat them because they will never be happy. Um, so obviously um, they're going to need readers. So. Uh, the vast majority of patients who come in don't understand that. I mean, a lot of patients come in um, pre-presbyopic saying, um, sort my both sides out now. So, 
you know, generally with the laser, we just treat the distance and then um, uh, sort of uh, readings up the glasses. You can do monovision, um, and if you've done monovision, then uh, uh, obviously they'll, uh, they'll probably want some uh, night driving glasses. Um, but all of this is about managing expectations. Uh, um, I have a questionnaire which uh, the patients fill out, and one of the, the first questions is, uh, what are you expecting? And um, as soon as they write 2020 on that, um, the alarm bells ring, and um, uh, then I decide whether I'm actually going to treat them or not. Um, whereas you, you know that if you, um, if you go for somebody who's uh, happy with an improvement, um, then you'll probably exceed their expectations. So we covered this a little bit. Um, uh, so the basic answer, if they're having laser, is uh, no, it's not going to do anything for the presbyopia. Um, but hyperopic treatments do give an increased depth of focus. So for a few years, you, they may, you know, if you treat a plus three, um, who's 45, they, um, they may get a few extra years out of it. Um, but it's not a cure. Uh, you have the monovision option. Um, I mean, I, I prefer to do that in patients who come asking for that, uh, because that's what they're doing anyway. Um, if not, I, um, I always send them away for a trial. So I, s I send them back to their own optometrist for a trial. Um, there are some presbyopic treatments where you change the asphericity of the cornea. Um, and, uh, well, some people um, are very, or claim they're very happy with it. They, uh, but they drop your distance, uh, distance acuity a bit. So most patients will end up 6'9", 6 6'12". Um, and with a compromised um, near solution as well. And I, I'm just not very comfortable with it as a good outcome. Because we spend the rest of the time trying to give good corneal shape, good corneal asphericity, <laughs> and then just to uh, treat the presbyopia, we go for a bad asphericity just so that they can read. Um, so yeah, it may come, but um, I don't feel we're there yet. How many aftercares do these patients need? Um, LASIK patients ought to be seen the next day. Um, LASIK PRK patients um, a week later. And then a month, three months, um, and then um, routine uh, optometric follow-up after that. So um, not a lot, but you have to build in to this that um, they may come back with problems. Um, they, may, they may need a um, hand holding. Um, that's quite common. So, is it going to make your eyes more dry? Um, yeah. So, this is a big problem. Um, so, most patients it's uh, temporary, um, but in some patients um, it's permanent. And um, if you if any of you ever look um, on the American websites, one of the biggest complaints um, and litigation uh, in America is uh, dry eyes. So I tend to just expect, uh, tell the patient to expect to use um, lubrication for um, three to six months. Um, if they uh, if they don't need it, that's fine. But at least that's uh, that's a seed implanted in their minds that that they're going to need to do it. Um, if they've got um, borderline dry eye, then I'll always go for a surface uh, treatment. With LASIK, what happens um, uh, rather than LASIK? Um, with LASIK, you actually cut the cornea and you sever the corneal nerves. So the sensation for um, producing tears has gone down. So you will get um, more dry eye than on a surface treatment. Uh, what's the best treatment if you do get um, post-laser uh, dry? Actually, it's no different from um, what you'd normally do, but you just have to be more aggressive, and probably these patients are going to be more demanding um, and, uh, uh, because the dry eyes can affect their vision. They're going to be unhappy with their quality of vision, and it becomes a bit of a vicious circle. So um, I think what, one of the questions asked was, uh, what would I use? I don't. Um, I, I like hyaluronic acid derivatives, um, but 
uh, not all patients do. You know, so some patients like particular um, uh, drops. So uh, I tend to start them on hyaluronic acid, but um, so, uh, so these are the options and um, go away and try it. I'm not a uh, um, great fan of cellulose because of the uh, largely the um, the more effective one will blur your vision and Optive is actually cellulose in a bottle uh, more or less so um, uh, it's uh, uh, but it, it it causes less of the blurring but um, low threshold for punctal plugs um, there may be some inflammation underlying some of this, so low threshold for steroids. And um, we don't have it easily available in this country, but uh, Ristasis, which is cyclosporin, um, is extensively used in America for, for this purpose. Um, for us to get it, it's, uh, we have to get it in through an international pharmacy, and it's uh, 150 pounds a month, and it's, uh, it's quite problematic. So can you wear contact lenses after laser surgery? If you have to, yeah, simple answer. Um, you know, fit may be a little bit more difficult. You might uh, might need to look at what you're using, but uh, there's no um, specific reason uh, why you can't. But whatever you do, this is surgery. Sometimes things go wrong, and uh, then the question is, um, what do you do about it? Um, in general. You just get on and sort it out. There, there's um, most of the things you should um, be able to um, um, sort out. But the key things here, like with any problem areas, is keep your relationship with the patient. Um, I tend to try and see um, these patients myself rather than put up a barrier to, uh, to seeing the patient. Um, I mean, I had a patient over, just over Christmas who, uh, um, well, a patient managed to give me viral conjunctivitis. Um, I managed to pass it on to the patient who was having laser, who passed it on to her husband and her daughter. Um, so she'd had laser and um, she had infiltrates all over the cornea. Um, she's sitting in the waiting room selling the procedure to the other patients because she's been managed well. Um, she, she thinks we're wonderful. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there worrying, her vision's only 612, 615 because she's got an infiltrate right in the middle. and. Um, um, she's perfectly happy. Um, if there's a problem, you need to be realistic. You need to explain the time scale. So, if you're talking retreatments, it may be um, it may be three months. Um, often, uh, the problems, particularly if, um, you know, go back to taking a history. Lots of the problems are variable vision, and laser or lens surgery, it's often uh, dry eyes. So it may be as simple as lubricating. Um, so you can re-laser. If things are really bad, um, you know, uh, IGB contact lenses if you've got an irregular cornea. Uh, and I've done, not many, but I think I've done three corneal transplants for patients from high street clinics who haven't been uh, managed properly. Um, and so, so when a patient asks you, will they go blind? Um, it's exceedingly unlikely, but Obviously, a corneal transplant is not a good outcome uh, if you've had laser surgery. So, this is a um, another one uh, question. Uh, uh, but why does it mess up your night vision? So, you know, there are um, some people uh, think it mess, um, messes up your night vision all the time. Um, but it depends a little bit on pupil size. Um, because if the pupil gets bi um, bigger or to the same, same size as your ablation diameter, then you'll get some uh, edge effects. Uh, particularly on a high treatment, um, you will reduce the contrast sensitivity for um, up to six months. Um, and I had a, a surgeon recently I did, and I had to point blank refuse to do both eyes um, at the same time because they were minus nine. Um, and um, um, because you, you were just worried about them working uh, afterwards, um, so we actually left it six months between eyes and uh, came back and uh, confirmed it was the right decision because um, it, it was down for a while. Um, so you can decenter your ablation, which will cause a bit, um, night vision problems. Obviously, if you've had LASIK, then they can be flap or surface irregularities. 
Okay. Um, now, just going to move on to refractive lens exchange. I mean, this is probably the the biggest um, uh, soft change recently. Um, I mean, in my practice, this is now 80% of what I do. So patients will come in for laser, but um, often they'll walk out with this. Um, I, again, I don't have a typical patient group, so that, that explains um, part of that. But uh, um, you'll see from the results why, why people will choose this. So again, this is, um, this is my data which has been published. So 41% of these are high myopes, um, and the range minus 6 to minus 18 in this group. Um, I've had two this year who are minus 27. Um, and if you think, for uh, um, both the minus 27s have ended up at 6.9 unaided. And uh, the change of life for them, um, you know, they're coming. Um, in fact, both of these two came in crying because uh, uh, you know, one, one of them was, uh, I didn't quite understand how he'd been grandfathered into um, HGV driving with his prescription, but you know, he had. Um, but uh, I think he was about to be found out, so uh, we had to do something. <laughs> Um, but he's retained his uh, um, career uh, just by doing that. Um, more, uh, nearly 60% are um, moderate to high high probes, um, so three and a half up to ten. Um, once you go be beyond ten, or it, it's 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 actually more to do with how small the eye is. Um, the risks start increasing dramatically. Um, so they're not young patients. Um, uh, but they're also not uh, they're not that old either. So results, um, I mean the post-op mean close enough to zero. Obviously that's the mean, but uh, the range was um, uh, plus one and a quarter to minus one and a quarter. So from from the extremes that I was talking about, that's uh, I felt that was acceptable. Ninety four percent within a diopter. 97% were 612 or better. 67 were 66 or better. So, and just keep coming back to, uh, you know, these will be the minus 15s that you're doing. Um, so, gain in their best potential vision just from magnification in 40%. So, we've done a few to, uh, you know, they're, uh, whether they're slightly amblyopic but they were just getting to um, um, sort of not getting to they've, they've just been on the borderline for driving um, anyway and then um, you get some mild um, lens changes which you wouldn't really call cataract but they're very mild changes and they're uh, um, the driving threatened you do this and the magnification gives you um, um, the edge so only one person lost the line of vision, and that was uh, from 6.5 to 6.6. And uh, this is what I was talking about before. Two ambly uh, supposedly amblyopic eyes went from 6.12 to 6.5. Uh, so uh, this is a known phenomenon. In uh, if you got even if you got a densely amblyopic eye, um, and you lose the other eye, the amblyopic eye at whatever age you are can regain some vision. So this is something to do with that. So um, all of this comes down to very accurate calculations, biometry. Um, if you're using, uh, if you use the wrong lens, you'll get the wrong result. So, um, so in my group, 64% um, were. The, um, so this is a separate study where the 64% were within a quarter of a diopter. The um, the, the figure in brackets is uh, a comparison to a large published study um, in another journal. So 83% uh, were within um, a half a diopter um, and 99% within um, a diopter. So, uh, you know, if, if you're doing refractive surgery, uh, this is, although it shouldn't be different from NHS cataract surgery, uh, just the practicalities of it, you've got more control about what you're doing. Um, and your audit systems, um, uh, or certainly my audit systems, better. So um, we feel we're doing reasonably well, and we certainly seem to be doing better than uh, other people on this. 
Then um, this is uh, Phil Buckhurst, who's in uh, Plymouth now, and this was his PhD. This, um, this is looking at, um, uh, these are defocus curves, so these are looking at uh, multifocal intraocular lenses. Um, and what, what you're seeing here is, um, this is in logmar, so zero logmar is 6-6. Um, uh, six, six. So uh, if you just look at the red one, which is both eyes, at a defocus of zero, so for distance, um, they're all doing very well. Um, and at a defocus of uh, about 2.5, so at um, so at a distance of about 40 centimeters, they they're getting um, reasonable reading, but not um, uh, not uh, what they tend to get is about n6 to n8. Um, but there's a there's a dip in there into intermediate, so. What this is trying to show is that, um, I mean, you can get the same sort of graphs for multifocal contact lenses, but none of these lenses are perfect. So they will give you um, generally good distance. They give you good reading, but not perfect reading. And um, intermediate is, uh, with this lens, is better than with a lot of lenses. But it's, um, uh, again, intermediate's not perfect. So. Um, if you're putting these sorts of lenses into patients, they need to be counselled um, that they may need to change their working distance for their computer and um, they're likely to need um, reading glasses for um, very small work as well. But, but you can put these lenses into, uh, these come as multifocal Torex, so you can, ha um, you, know, you can treat a minus 15 um, with a minus 6 um, cylinder. Uh, astigmatism and get them pretty functional um, without. But it goes back to if you counsel them properly, um, they're not going to mind that they're not perfect. So poor results. Uh, this is a Brian Tompkins picture on one of my patients. So um, uh, you know, dry eye, um, almost invariable after um, uh, lens surgery. It's not talked about very much, but um, it's always there, and these patients need to lubricate as well. Um, multifocal lenses, you do get um, photopic phenomenon, so you need to warn uh, patients about uh, um, sort of glare, halos. Uh, depends on the choice of lens, and there are, uh, the ones I use at the moment are segmental bifocal, so they um, they're multifocal lenses, but they they look as if they have a bifocal segment on the lens. So what they've done is they've, um, they've made a, uh, the multifocality only in 100 degrees of the lens, so um, the light transmission's a lot better. They, some of you may have tried, um, there is a contact lens of that sort which, uh, which has been available from Belgium for 20 odd years, but it, uh, it never took off, and I, I suspect it's just because it moves, you don't quite get the segments in the right place. But inside an eye, they work very well. Um, you can get ghosting. Um, if you get a poor refractive result, you can laser these patients on top. So um, generally, ten, uh, I prefer to do LASIK rather than LASIK. Um, but that's personal choice. So co-management, uh, I'll have to speed up a little bit. Um, so is this what everyone worries about? Uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, there appear to be almost two camps that um, the, the for refractive surgery co-management and the against, and um, there are not that many people who just dabble in it a little bit. So, a few questions. Um, what's the position on indemnity? I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but as, uh, I, as long as you're working within an area of expertise or training, you're fine. So for laser, you may need to, um, you know, you may need a little bit more training. Um, but uh, essentially, it's an anti-segment examination, which all of you are um, able to do. <coughs> Ideally, you work within prescribed parameters, um, and you have a, pr a procedure for com complication management. Th this is just to co um, cover you from a sort of governance point of view. Um, and so when do you refer back, uh, you know, what, what's urgent and what isn't? Um, well, hopefully you, don't, you wouldn't ever see the situation where uh, the lens isn't sitting in the right place. Um, but, uh, 
you know, obviously that needs referral, but that, um, what you need to do first is agree um, these sorts of things with the surgeon. Um, it's best to be able to contact somebody um, because uh, what you feel is urgent, the surgeon may not feel is urgent and um, rather than uh, um, sort of uh, send a patient unnecessarily, um, it's easier just to have a conversation um, before, you, um, before you send. With LASIK, the only real urgent um, uh, thing is infection. So it'll be this, um, look the same as a contact lens related infection. Um, with LASIK, uh, you, um, you need to be a bit more aware about the flap and uh, how it's sitting, uh, and that can be urgent. With um, refractive lens exchange, it um, depends on the um, if there's infection or there's a wound or lens issue. <laughs> so, when you're deciding whether to refer back, I mean, if you've got topography, if you've got OCT, um, you can assess the tear function, that's great. Um, with, uh, uh, I'm just remembering whether this one's a, uh, one of yours, Nick. Nick's in the back somewhere. Okay. So um, you know, so we've, um, uh, Nick Romney and I have had a uh, couple where they've got some uh, mild uh, macular edema following their lens um, surgery. Um, the uh, uh, they, um, so the treatment for that is um, steroid and, and a non-steroidal. Um, Nick's an independent prescriber, so we just. Um, sort of discuss what, uh, what to do. Um, one of the patients, uh, the pressure shot up, um, so we discussed uh, what to do on that front as well. Um, so, um, depends, um, you know, you do what you're, um, you feel you're trained up to. Um, so what, why do you pick a specialist surgeon? Um, well, I think you, so that you know what you're getting firstly. Um, if you refer to a high street clinic, the, uh, the difficulty is that the surgeon's not named until the day, often for the patient. So even if they want to check on uh, check up on the person, they may not be able to. Um, patients are more comfortable um, if if they see the same person. The co-management is easier because uh, you know uh, email, phone, um, th there is an answer. If there's a problem. Because uh, both parties know each other, um, that can be um, managed uh, uh, well as well. Now, referral fees um, versus co um, versus paid um, co-management. So, I'm just going to very quickly uh, touch on this. So, um, some people want referral fees for, uh, I mean, some, uh, fees for a referral without doing any work. And some people will say that's not acceptable. Um, and the GOC has a guidance on this, and um, that any payment is in keeping with the amount of work performed. So if you expect, and there are a lot of people out there who do, if you expect £200 for writing a letter and not doing anything else, is that what you'd expect for writing a letter to the local uh, consultant surgeon for a cataract, for a, for a private cataract? If it isn't, then you need to look at it. Um, and uh, but it, it is a grey area. It's not set down that, uh, and prescribed. This is exactly what you have to do. So this is where your difficulty comes in. But uh, um, but I, I think uh, I mean c certainly I try and be uh, squeaky clean about this. And, uh, uh, and you as an optometrist have uh, are supposed to declare to the patient what you're getting out of this anyway. So wherever the money comes, you should be telling the patient. And so uh, a lot of this comes back down to how, uh, what your um, rates are and what you feel is acceptable. And these are the very last few. So if you have a cataract in a LASIK patient, that's a problem. Um, because the, uh, the measurements, um, the biometry that we do uh, is inaccurate. So there are algorithms that you um, can use for this, but ideally to use these algorithms, you need the pre-op case, post-op case, and pre and post-op refractions immediately after surgery. So, because what you don't want is any index myopia coming into the calculation. So ideally you want the patients to keep a lot of data. And you need to warn the patient that this is a risk. And 
you need to do an early refraction because if you're a long way out, you may need to swap the lens. Um, and you can re-laser these patients. I think this is the last one now. Um, annual eye checks. Um, what do you need to look out for? So if, um, we published on this when I was in Manchester many years ago um, that uh, laser surgery apparently drops your intraocular pressure. So um, typically if you have a minus seven, minus eight treatment, your intraocular pressure will be down by five. So um, all your laser patients are effectively normal tension glaucoma patients. You know, they behave, uh, they may behave like with a normal pressure, but you have to keep going on the fields and the discs. Uh, you can use some compensation factors. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you know what they've had treated, then you can uh, adjust a little bit. And there's some nomograms for that. But first thing is be aware of it. Obviously, it's still a myopic eye. So look out for the myopic problems. Um, these patients are less tolerant to early cataract and um, this happens fairly frequently unfortunately that increasing myopia is put down to um, uh, a regression of the result even if it's 15 years down the line and uh, nobody looks to see that they're developing cataract. So is this one of your comments again Nick? It's, uh, so, um, so when we started this talk, um, I just uh, asked um, some, uh, for some questions and comments, and uh, I'm sure this is a, uh, one of Nick's, uh, that um, refractive surgery is not a threat to business, it can actually enhance your business. But ultimately, um, this is all about teamwork, and thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Sunil. So we do have um, time for some questions now. So we do have some uh, roving microphones. Um, so if you put your hand up, uh, just got one here, first of all. Could you tell me which past corneal conditions or conditions that are in remission uh, would mitigate against you performing any of this refractive surgery. Uh, what, what sorts of things are you talking about? This uh, or? People who possibly had previous maybe herpes infections or uh, uh, other sort of corneal infections, endothelial problems, yeah. things of that sort. It's, it's on an individual basis. So if, if you go to a high street clinic, if they've got anything wrong in the, uh, on the cornea, the likelihood is they won't be treated because they'll fall outside of their parameters. Um, if you're going to a, a corneal surgeon, they'll look at it on, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, a single episode of a hepatic disease, still quite risky, but you can cover it with um, acyclovir tablets to try and prevent remission. Um, so uh, nothing's impossible, but uh, it, it, it just depends on what it is. So bacterial infection is not normally a problem. Uh, viral infection, because it's still sitting there, you, um, you're, you're quite reluctant normally. Thank you. Any other questions just to be here? What's, um, sorry, what's the youngest age you'd do the surgery on? It's... Um, well, uh, if you're looking at um, sort of 18, 21 year olds, it, uh, I mean, what you're really looking for is um, stability of uh, prescription more than a specific age. So, um, uh, ultralays used to set their limit at 18, which uh, I felt was a bit young. Um, uh, most people go for 21. But, you know, if, if you've got two years of stability, before that and they've got a small prescription um, and they understand the issues, then uh, I don't um, have a particular issue. Uh, it's probably um, a good treatment for uh, young children um, who've got um, uh, particularly my, uh, myopic uh, anisometropia. So uh, there are studies uh, going on where um, uh, it's, it's done for that. and um, So there's no definite cut off, it just depends on uh, what you're trying to achieve. Thank you. Uh, 
sorry, um, Gordon, then uh, Garant, please. Hi, um, you've alluded to possible um, malpractice within the laser surgery field. Do you feel that the industry is adequately regulated? Um, because I think most of us have come across cases where it seems that people are giving poor advice to patients. I've got a patient who's treated in the mid 2000s with a radial keratotomy, very successful result for about a year, and has gone from being a minus three myope to now having 450 cells, um, and a very interesting topography reading. So it's really whether they, some of these practitioners may bring your profession into disrepute or damage your business model. I don't worry too much about my business model, uh, the, um, but um, it's a difficult one. There, uh, there was a um, all parliamentary review back in '97 when it was suggested that uh, this was regulated more, um, and uh, uh, actually got to a stage within the College of uh, Ophthalmologists uh, where. Um, there was some thought about bringing refractive surgery into the, the, the standard training scheme so that everybody had some degree of exposure and then some people could branch off and just do that. Um, and uh, I don't know the ins and outs, but certainly one of, uh, um, one of the issues at that point was uh, one of the high street um, uh, companies put up a legal challenge saying it was restricted practice. So it's, it's a difficult one. I, I mean, it's, um, Plastic surgery is the same. You know, they're, they're all fields which are um, which could probably do with more regulation. But as the regulation comes from people within establishment, um, it's often seen badly uh, by the people who are, uh, uh, who, are not, uh, who are not within the establishment. Thank you. In the, in the long term, in LASIK, what holds the flap on? In the short term, what holds the flap on? And in the long term, does scar tissue form between the flap and the underlying stroma? In the short term, it's uh, it's just sort of hydrostatic suction. You know, it just uh, sticks back on, but it's, it's still mobile. Um, there was there is some reaction over time, but you can always lift it. Uh, I mean, I've uh, I think the furthest one I've done has been about 15 years out. Came up straight away. So, um, I, I mean, there are a lot of corneal surgeons who are shifting on to surface treatment because if you've got something which is never going to heal, then it's, a, it's always going to be an issue. I mean, um, I'm in the middle of doing, um, the, the forces are looking to introduce refractive surgery for their high value personnel. So I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a um, pilot study on, on the SAS. Um, and we decided at, at the outset that they can't have LASIK. You know, um, I mean, you, you saw that picture of the uh, rugby player. Um, somebody in the SAS gets poked in the eye in, in Afghanistan, uh, and the flap comes off. What they're going to do? Um, so, uh, so the forces are likely to go purely for surface treatment uh, on a safety basis. Okay. We have a question. Thank you very much, and thank you, Sunil, for an excellent talk. I just wanted to comment on that question about regulation. Um, uh, Bruce Keogh, who's the medical director of NHS England, has undertaken a review of cosmetic procedures, and uh, to the College of Ophthalmologists, we wrote to him to include refractive surgery in it, which he did. So, and he has personally written back to me saying that um, all the recommendations coming out of that review of cosmetic procedures will include by name refractive surgery as well. So I think we will see some government action after all. Thank you. So just our last question here from the lady who's been waiting very patiently. Yeah. For um, an adult with binocular vision problem, so a plus four hypermetrate with either a fully a com or partially a com, um, is that something that would be treated or it's too unpredictable that they're sort of fully a com or stay fully a com if you get rid of their prescriptions? Again, it depends on um, sort of the teamwork. Uh, so normally I send um, to uh, one, 
of our orthoptists who I work quite closely with and uh, um, if she tells me that the um, risk of post-operative diplopia is, um, is low then we go for it um, but the patient needs to be aware that uh, uh, well sorry the other thing you need to do is um, surgery has got to be very quick between eyes so I tend to do it a couple of days apart because uh, 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 either that or they've got to keep a contact lens in the other eye because if um, if uh, one eye drifts off completely in between, then you then you'll be in trouble. But uh, um, but I've got uh, I've got the backup of a um, squint surgeon uh, behind me. So if, uh, uh, it's, uh, but it's, um, no, but the, these are the patients. You know, it's horrible being plus four. Um, and um, once you've explained to them what the risk is, um, if they still want to go ahead um, and they understand there may be other issues, then um, that's fine. Well, uh, let's thank uh, Sunil again. That's been a really